I want to do. Um, what I want to do is uh, I want to, um, sorry, I want to give you an overview um, over what these matrix product states are, how you calculate ground states and time evolution, what the challenges challenges are that you will face if you um, if you go into um, electronic structure, and then I want to talk about um, the coupling to uh, vibrations, so rather go into reactions. Um, and talk specifically about singlet uh, fission as an example, which I have looked at recently. And the second paper, which you find at the bottom, actually was um, accepted for publication uh, just um, just this afternoon. So it's 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 all very recent. Um, and um, I hope to give you an introduction to all of that. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so these matrix product states in a very formal way, we imagine a quantum system living on L orbitals or L states. We have D local states per orbital, which I will call generically sigma i. And then the Hilbert space is, of course, as you know, the tensor product of the local states. And the most general state is the one which I write down here, the psi with the exponentially many coefficients um, C. And so to motivate the matrix product states, the first idea is, of course, to do what we always do in solid state as the first step is to go to a mean field approximation, Hartree Fock like, which would mean that we factorize um, these coefficients um, into coefficients which basically only take into account what is happening locally on one of those orbitals. This, of course, suppresses the exponential growth, but among, among any many other disadvantages, of course, it has the one fundamental disadvantage that it does not capture anything um, uh, related to quantum entanglement. And so this is a motivation to say, basically do the most simple thing that you can do, stay with this local factorization, but re replace the scalars by matrices. The matrices then depend on the local states. So you have matrices M, Sigma, I, where sigma is the state on, on orbital i. And then the state is simply given um, by um, the, the, the superposition in red here, where basically the exponentially many coefficients have been replaced by the matrix products. So you are still working in the full computational basis, but what you are constraining are effectively your wave, um, wave function coefficients. And for example, a, a triplet state as given here, it's about the simplest entangled state you can imagine would be captured by the matrices, which I list at the bottom of the slide. If you multiply them out, you will see they will exactly reproduce the up-up pairing up and the down-down pairing up. And this is, of course, an almost trivial example, but actually there are really physically important models like the famous affleck kennedy leap tasaki model. It's a topological model. It explains the special physics of the spin-1 Heisenberg chain, which you can fully describe um, with matrices which just have a dimension two. So this is, of course, not where you stop. You, you, you push up these dimensions of these matrices to be really large. We call them uppercase D in this talk, capital D, and they will be in the hundreds, thousands, or sometimes even larger in some weird applications. Okay, so because it's all about tensors, we switch to a um, um, uh, uh, a graphical notation where it's basically very simple. If you concentrate on the, the bulk object in the center, you have this one leg sticking out um, vertically to denote the physical state. Many people let it put down, uh, uh, let it show downwards. Um, well, that's a matter of choice, but basically it's always vertical. And then the left and the right leg are basically the indices of the matrix. And then writing down a matrix product state where you multiply these matrices is nothing but a contraction where you say, I put these objects next to each other. And then if they are connected by a line, they are contracted. So it's an extremely simple graphical notation, um, which quite a lot of the literature is um, presented in if you want to avoid to go through all the details. But of course, if you implement it, you have to do that. So of course, where there are matrix product states, there must be matrix product operators. The most general operator you can um, write down takes any state of the computational basis. 
puts out any state of the computational basis with some amplitude. So there are again exponentially many coefficients and you apply the same idea that basically the whole thing is happening locally. Um, so you factorize it again into matrices and uh, as opposed to the state which has one ingoing which has one leg basically for the physical um, the local state um, the operator has of course one ingoing and one outgoing leg so you have you have always these sigma sigma prime configurations for the ingoing and the outgoing state and the interesting thing is that compared to the states where for um, a strongly correlated quantum state, we will typically not be able to write it down exactly as a matrix product state. Formally, yes, but not in computational practice. Um, the operators actually are usually quite compact. Um, uh, so for example, um, a local spin operator is the identity matrix everywhere except on the side where the spin operator acts. And typically short range Hamiltonians as they are considered in condensed matter physics also find very, very simple and compact representations in this way. And this will be one of the issues actually coming up uh, in quantum chemistry where this is not the case. And the graphical representation is then very simple. You stay with this comb-like structure, but now it has an ingoing and an outgoing leg. So if you take one of these operators, we can stay totally abstract. Um, the application to a matrix product state is basically you just stick it on top of one of these uh, matrix product states as showing, shown in the top figure. You can actually do that matrix by matrix, one by one. But what you see is if you cut out one of these vertical objects, you see that there is now a double index sticking out to the left or to the right, which means that effectively the matrix dimension of the new matrix product state is the product of the dimension of the MPO and of the matrix product state. If you add matrix product states, it's a similar story, just that the matrix dimensions are added, not multiplied. In any case, whatever you do, the typical consequence is that you have to basically have an algorithm which compresses your growing matrix product state back to one in size, which you can handle on your computer. This is of course not a topic for an introductory lesson, but this is covered in all the reviews how to do that. So basically we have a full set of tools now to operate with quantum states and we can do basically all of quantum mechanics within the world of these um, matrix product states. And of course, one of the questions you ask typically in a many body problem, as we all know, is finding a ground state. But of course, now the question is finding the ground state for a given Hamiltonian, not in the, in the full Hilbert space, but in this constrained Hilbert space populated by the matrix product states. You reformulate it as a typical minimization problem with a Lagrangian multiplier, and now what comes to bear is this graphical notation uh, which I introduced. So we take the minimization expression on the top, the psi h psi minus lambda psi psi to ensure uh, a normalization. And so what is psi h psi? Well, this gives you a structure where you have an MPS on the bottom, then you have the H, the MPO, which stands for the Hamiltonian operator. And on top, you have the bra, which you denote graphically by simply turning the MPS around. So if they point up like this, it's a ket. If they point down like that, it's a bra. And so minus the lambda psi psi, well, psi psi is then simply this ladder-like structure. Now you want to minimize that. This is of course a complicated problem because it's highly multilinear in all these uh, matrices. So what you do is you iteratively, um, iteratively minimize the energy by picking one matrix after another um, and basically minimizing this means, of course, we take the first derivative, set it to zero because it's all linear. Taking the derivative just means kicking out the matrix. And then you get the, the picture where you see there's always one matrix mi missing that has to be zero. What is a bit unpleasant here is you still have this complicated ladder-like structure um, um, as the second object. 
Um, the point is what you can do here is by suitable normalizations, there are gauge degrees of freedom inherent in matrix product states. You can turn that into a simple standard eigenvalue problem. The problem is the, the eigenvalue problem is huge. So the dimension of the eigenvalue, eigen, the vectors is typically of the order of say 10 million to 100 million, um, depending on the number of states you keep in your matrix product state. But this is managed, manageable by Lansosh or Jacoby Davidson um, algorithms. So of course, when you do that, you have only improved the energy or you have improved the state with respect to one matrix and make the energy go down to actually get to the ground state, what you have to do is you have to do that everywhere. So basically what you do is you let this site where you actually pick the matrix with which with respect to which you optimize, you let that go forth and back and the energy will always go down. And this is the fundamental idea of the DMRG algorithm to continue with this going forth and back and optimizing until the whole thing has converged and the proper way of um, monitoring it is, of course, to look at the variance of the energy. Okay, so um, having done the ground states, the question is, of course, why, why does this actually work? And I mean, I, we already had today several times the mentioning of the Schmidt decomposition as a way of um, working out a representation of a state. It gives us immediate access to the reduced density matrix. I mean, here in this audience, I don't have to say anything about it, but the point is, of course, of course, a matrix product state, if you cut it somewhere in the middle, it has M row and column in this, um, M rows and M columns, or sorry, D rows and columns of these M matrices meeting each other. So the Schmidt decomposition has at most um, D, uh, contributions in the sum. And what you can work out is that, that then the entanglement, which you can encode in such a matrix product state is limited by the logarithm of the matrix dimension of the matrix product state, which is then of course, what you have to turn around and say, the dimension you have to choose is essentially the exponential of the entanglement that your quantum state that you want to capture has. Okay. now. Is this good or bad? Well, it depends. What helps us that for some states, in particular ground states, but not only ground states, the entanglement, interestingly enough, although it has the form of an entropy, the von Neumann row log row, it only grows with the system surface. That's the so-called entanglement law going back all the way to um, black hole physics. Um, and that means in one dimension where DMRG performs so brilliantly, the surface is always a point, which means that if the system becomes larger and larger, the entanglement will basically, at least in gapped systems, not grow. In critical systems, it will grow um, uh, logarithmically, and therefore the, the dimension of the matrices will grow up like a power law, but nothing like exponential. In two dimensions, in three dimensions, unfortunately, it's not like that. So this becomes very hard for DMRG, although not totally impossible when it comes to two-dimensional systems. They will be typically stripe-like. Okay, so, um, and that's what I'm showing here. If you now want to go to quantum chemistry, this is much more complicated than the typical systems we look at in condensed matter physics, where we brutally simplify everything down to something like the Hubbard model. And then we can do something like 2D systems, like on a chain. And there I would like to advertise a paper I had with Steve White and Shiva Sang, where we look at the 2D Hubbard model with all methods sort of like in the field uh, combined using up to one 100,000 as matrix dimension in the MPS. I think that's pretty much a record in that, um, in that field. Okay, but the point is, of course, as you all know, you know the generic Hamiltonian in second quantization and quantum chemistry. I can uh, jump that slide very uh, quickly. But the problem you have is, of course, in condensed matter physics, we typically have very simple interactions normally. The V, I, J, K, L is in our case often just a single U, not more, nothing else. In your case, it's not. 
And therefore, one of the bottlenecks you have to overcome is to find suitable representations and constructions of the matrix product operator. You have to get it to work um, right in the beginning. I think Stefan and Ursch will probably talk about that. Um, and then because there are so many interaction terms, the actual calculation of this MPO applied to an MPS H times Psi as the fundamental operation of um, DMRG is of course extremely um, time consuming and that limits us to, I mean, it depends a little bit on the symmetries to have to say perhaps 40 or 60 orbitals by brute force and perhaps even that is already uh, quite optimistic. Um, okay, but as I know that, um, um, okay, so the simplest thing you can do is, of course, to think about DMRG as a replacement of, of a complete active space method, ignore all the rest. You can take more orbitals into account because it's a very good approximation typically. Um, but um, uh, this is, of course, limited, as I said, just in these 40 to 60 orbitals at most. So what you need, and there I refer really to the later talks before I come to the vibrational aspects, um, this is where you have to think about embedding methods. And I think several of the talks earlier uh, today already mentioned their method and then DMRG in front as basically the method that deals with the active space. Um, and then basically it's extended to take into account the dynamical um, correlations. But here really, I think I should not waste more time and rather uh, leave that to Stefan and Ursch. So what I want to talk about briefly is what do we do when we want to do time evolution? Now, as you have seen, the fact that we get away with this very little entanglement uh, was dependent on a very specific property of a very small set of states, namely typically ground states and a few others that have the, that obey this area law and you can effectively even show that this is a set of measure zero in in a, in a in a hilbert space these states that obey that it's just that's the ones we often like to to work with but if you do time evolution if you perturb the system or so what you will do is you will leave this cozy corner of hilbert space where the matrix product state works very well and you will start feeling um, the full force of entanglement, which in channel will, uh, will basically be volume-like. Um, and that can actually be quantified. And one can show that the entanglement in the worst case, that will be typically global quenches, where you change the entire Hamiltonian, not just locally. Um, the growth of entanglement can be up to linear in time with some constant. Um, and that means that the dimension of the matrix product states will grow um, exponentially. That means that the reach we have in time is quite limited, but we still can solve quite a lot of useful problems, as I hope I will show you in the next remaining um, couple of minutes. Before I do that, just a few words on the, the, the methods we use in DMRG for time evolution. I would say there are now at the moment two major workhorses. There's now quite a plethora of time evolution methods in DMRG, um, but I would say two are the most used one. The oldest one is one which basically trotterizes the time evolution into small exponential steps. There you neglect that um, the operators typically will not commute, but the error you make is small because it scales um, only with delta t squared in the worst approximation and delta t to some higher power in better approximations. That's a standard technique that works well for short-ranged interactions. So for quantum chemistry, it's not the best one, but it's kind of the simplest one to implement because what you basically have to do is you basically construct the MPO, which gives you this little exponential time evolution, which is relatively easy to write down. And then you simply you apply it, the MPS will grow in, in dimension because that always happens when you apply an MPO, you truncate it down, apply it again, truncate, apply, truncate, apply. Um, the point is, um, as I said, this mainly works for short range Hamiltonians. What is much more interesting for people in the field of um, uh, quantum chemistry, I guess, is methods that I think you have known much longer than people have used them in physics, which is basically the time-dependent variational principle where you reformulate the time evolution 
as a variational principle that you basically you want to minimize um, the expression h psi minus i times the time derivative of psi because I mean this is just rewriting the uh, the Schrodinger equation and what we do in 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 the TDVP algorithm we project this equation down on the tangent space of um, of psi. So this is exact when it comes to the time derivative, because this is basically the definition that something like this lives in the uh, tangent space. It's not exact when it comes to the object h psi. When you project that, you will make a small um, projection error. And this is what happens in this method. But um, the question is, of course, how do you implement that in a matrix product state? So what's the tangent space of a matrix product state? And then that is actually very simple because it's multilinear in its matrix elements. A linear change is basically just what happens if you keep all matrices fixed and let one of them vary. Then this is a linear change. And of course, what you don't want if you do this variation, that you still keep a component parallel to the original state. And what you can introduce is basically um, a projector, which I have written at the bottom of the slide, which basically does that. It keeps all the matrices fixed except on one side. And that side you let walk through the chain. And then you subtract a projection on the original state so that you do not stay in the original state and just get what has changed. So this, of course, is a complicated projector um, to write down. And so how can you turn that into a useful algorithm? Because if you, if you look at the projected time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which I have written at the top, and then you have this very complicated projector P, it looks a bit unpleasant. But then you basically use the same idea as in trotterization that you say the error you make if you basically um, pretend that these objects act independently, um, that this is not so big. So what then happens is you can turn that into a sequence of little time evolution steps, which happen just locally. Um, and these you can solve quite easily. There's no time for me here to go into the technical um, uh, details I've, as I've gotten very strict advice uh, to keep the time. Um, but um, uh, this is sort of like, I would say at the moment, the most powerful method we have for time evolution. There are variants of that. Um, I uh, briefly talk about that, where you do not just vary one matrix after another, but pairs of matrices that is slower, but has certain advantages. And, um, and if you want to read more details about that, I would like to refer uh, to this review about time evolution methods, which we published in 2019. Let me now finally um, come in the last few minutes to applications of that in uh, quantum um, uh, chemistry. And this is basically about the uh, coupling between electrons and vibrations, as is, of course, decisive in, in chemical reactions or uh, similar um, processes. And I see there's something in the chat. If it's a question, could you please read it out or we wait for a second? Peter, you are mute. Just to say you've had 25 minutes, that's all. Yeah, OK, good. I, I, I'm keeping my eye on the watch. Very good. So what I um, so what I want to show is because this is sort of like the problem, of course, if you if you look up, if you think about uh, vibrations, is quite generically that if you look at electronic degrees of freedom, the orbital has a small number of local degrees of freedom. It's empty or occupied or spin up, spin down, whatever. With phonons or general bosonic modes, of course, the Hilbert space is in principle locally infinitely large. And so the question is, what do we do about that? And I mean, the standard model which you would um, study in such a case is, of course, the typical model, say the electronic system is extremely simple, even non-interacting, but that's not really a problem for us to make it interacting. Then we have the bosonic vibration modes or rotation modes, whatever, all this bosonic stuff. Um, and then you have a coupling between the electronic and the vibrational degrees of freedom. And so, um, uh, and then there is actually this problem that you require a maximum bosonic occupation number. And the question is, can you make this big enough to capture the chemistry or physics 
of the problem. So I jumped, I, did, I took out the slides on pyrazine where we checked whether our algorithm works compared to a multi-configurational time-dependent heart rate. It works extremely well, it's even faster, um, but I don't want to bore you with that, but directly go to the singlet fission where the idea is you, you, you go into a photovoltaic cell, you generate an electron hole pair, by excitation as a singlet. And then there are conversion mechanisms to convert that one pair into two, which form, however, triplets. Okay, as spin one plus spin, spin one can still be a spin zero. And the transport properties of these um, triplets are much better. And the yield of the solar cell would be much enhanced. And the direct process of converting such a local excitation of an electron hole pair into, um, into two pairs of triplets is actually the, the amplitude is basically zero. So this has to go through some intermediate state, which in so pentacene or tetracene is some kind of intermediate charge transfer state. And this has been investigated a lot. So that's why we took that to check our algorithm. And let me jump how one constructs these Hamiltonians. Chemists know that extremely well. Um, and let me also jump this slide where we just show that we get excellent agreement with multi-configurational time-dependent heart rate. So the problem that we faced, however, was that to get some really interesting chemistry done, very often the number of modes we could uh, so the occupation numbers which we could place on the modes was very limited. So as you can see here on the slide, it says something like we are dealing with 183 vibrational modes or so. That's no problem. The problem is how many bosons do I put in each of these modes? And we were limited to something like eight or 10. And if we knew some mode was important, perhaps 20, but we could not go beyond. And what I want to show you in the last, if the chairman bears with me with another two or three minutes, um, what I want to show to you is a wonderful idea, a very simple idea um, that one of my postdocs, Sebastian Peckel had, is where he said, okay, the, the phonon number is of course not conserved. We typically have this B dagger plus B operator popping up in these Hamiltonians, but in DMRG, an enormous speed up is always generated if you have quantum symmetries like conserved particle numbers, which here we normally don't have. And the idea is that by doubling um, the local space of the phonons, you can basically introduce pseudo phonons, which do not really exist, but you put in so many of them that altogether the exact number of phonons plus, plus pseudo phonons is conserved. It's a very simple idea and ultimately you, you, you trace them out. So it's basically a very efficient way of bookkeeping the number of phonons. The additional cost is almost zero and they call this projected purification because it's very similar to the way how people do purify um, thermal states um, in, in DMRG. And the speed up which you expect from that is of the order 10 to 100. And that time you can of course reinvest in a much larger number of um, bosons you can allow um, per mode. So I can of course in the questions to, um, talk more about that. So what we did is we now looked at tetracine um, dimers. There are five electronic states which play into this singlet fission. Um, chemists have identified 258 vibrational modes in that object. Um, 76 of them actually have already 99.9% .9 of influence of reshaping the electronic modes. These ones we kept. And this was that was not the difficult part, but the difficult part was that we are now able to go up to occupation numbers up to 63. And really, I think this was the first full time full quantum dynamics um, of this model. The speed up, which you can see on the right hand side, I just say notice the logarithmic scale. Um, the speed up was about factor 40 or even more, depending on the set of parameters. This is actually the worst case scenario that we just got a speed up of factor of 40. And this allowed us really to look at the uh, conversion into these um, uh, 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 triplets, uh, um, triplets in full detail. And what we found is 
um, first of all, two slides to go. The first of all is that, is it really no necessary to go to this very high occupation number? Didn't we just do that just for the fun because we can do it? Well, it was necessary because what you see in the picture on the left is that the weight of the modes which you get if you really go up with the maximum occupation number, which you can see on the top left, the modes seem to be not very important. They have weights of 10 to the minus five or something. But on the other hand, they enter with B dagger B, so with the occupation number. So ultimately the weights pile up a lot. And if you are only doing say 20 modes at 20 as the maximum occupation number, you miss out on, on a substantial part of the time evolution. And actually it's not just, um, quantitatively different, but qualitatively different. I will show this on the last slide. But before I do that, just to show that in this simulation, we can reproduce without any additional fitting parameters, um, the um, observed experimental absorption spectra. And we can calculate now how in time in a few hundred femtoseconds, how this occupation of this uh, triplets goes up. And this is of course what is wanted um, to get these more efficient um, solar cells. But if you look more closely, this is the last slide is, um, we looked at how on the left, how this um, triplet occupation, how this goes up with time. And first, at first, we wanted to understand how we could make the whole process more efficient by placing the whole thing in different solvents because it's going through a charge transfer mode in uh, a state in between so polarity of the solvent will have a high influence in how easily you get into that state and so what we found is perhaps not so surprisingly that you can make this triplet generation much more efficient with suitably uh, uh, polarizing um, solvents but what was more surprising for us was this observation that you, you see perhaps on the left slide um, that at about 35 femtoseconds, there's always this kink. There's a very efficient production of these triplets on the very first femtoseconds. And then basically whatever we took as parameters, then it starts flattening out and very rapidly. And so we decided to investigate this more in detail, and this is something where we really need this full number of huge um, phonon occupation numbers, because what we found out is that there's a transition from a coherent to a decoherent regime, which actually happens more or less precisely at these 35 femtoseconds, which we identified, it's actually too good to be true, I always almost find, is that in the first 35 femtoseconds, there is one vibrational mode, which is absolutely dominant, and it has a way of deforming the molecules such that this um, uh, second order process from the local excitation into these triplets is very strong, uh, strongly facilitated. And after these 35 femtoseconds, decoherence, basically dissipation of energy in all these many vibrational modes happens very quickly, and actually the conversion process becomes suppressed. And this produces the kink. For more details, unfortunately, I have for lack of time to refer um, to the paper we wrote. But I just wanted to give you an idea here that for those of you who are perhaps interested in modeling the, the interaction between electronic and vibrational modes, this algorithmic advantage could really pave the way to quite a lot of uh, interesting results in the future, hopefully. So instead of reading it out, I just show you the conclusion. And I'm very happy now to take um, questions um, about DMRG and all the other things. And please ask me directly as for whatever reason, I cannot open the chat at the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, so let's, uh, if you want to ask a question, if you can stick your hand, use a Zoom hand, that, that will be helpful. Um, yep, Gustavo, mm -hmm. please go ahead. Hey, um, hi, Ulrich, can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Yes. yes, so great talk, thank you. I, I have a question about low entanglement states. Mm -hmm. And when you say that DMRG or MPS is a low entanglement state, is that dependent on the basis where you express the matrix product state? It's, it's only in a local basis. If I use delocalized orbits, does mm -hmm. that still hold? 
okay, so for us, for us sort of like, um, the, the, this is actually in some sense a question which I hope Ursh will take up, at least perhaps probably Stefan also, that of course the amount of entanglement that is present in a state can be strongly influenced by the choice of the basis. I mean, it's not a basis independent um, a property. So what, what one should do is first of all, think about introducing modes uh, which uh, uh, spaces which right from the beginning are more adapted to the problem you're dealing with. In the typical condensed matter problem, the lo local Vanier basis is usually a very good choice. You can improve it, but it's a good point to start with. This That is something which you can do. And then another thing which um, Ursh will certainly talk about is um, once you have modes you like, and in a quantum chemistry problem, you can think about them as each, each of them talk to every other one. Um, in solid state, typically, mainly neighbors talk to each other in our Hubbard-like models. So the way you arrange your orbitals in solid state is very simple. It's You just reproduce the geometry of your lattice to start with. But in quantum chemistry, it makes much more sense to first analyze which of these in a sort of like low efficiency calculation, which of these orbitals are actually strongly entangled among each other by analyzing mutual information. And then you redo the calculation at high accuracy, putting those guys close to each other. Uh, that can be done by a sort of like graph analysis, Fiedler vector and these sort of techniques. Um, and then the whole calculation becomes much, much more um, efficient. Basically, you do that routinely, and that has been pioneered a long time ago by Ursh. Like yes, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a question. I mean, I mean, if you look at the original linear positioning group, I think you integrate. I mean, the physical picture is very clear. You integrate degrees of freedom, which is irrelevant, and you go to the effective space, and you look at the different length scales. So mm -hmm. this approach, what is the physical, I mean, the original, like, uh, if you'd like to map it to the realization group, how do we understand the process? Um, this is actually a, a very interesting question, which in a kind of a longer presentation, I would basically elaborate on. DMRG has gone through sort of like a major reformulation. What you have seen here is the sort of like the way of looking at DMRG as a variational method. Yeah, and you, vary, you variationally optimize energies within the space of matrix product states. At that point, the link to RG is actually not very clear at all. Um, what you can also do, what you can, if you look at the original formulation of uh, DMRG by Steve White, um, what, what he did is basically, and this is something which however is very typical of a translationally invariant system as you would have it in, 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 in condensed matter physics. He would like you do it in Wilson NRG. You would take small blocks of a system, grow them iteratively in size, and where NRG basically has a flow in energy space, you keep the low energy degrees of freedom, renormalize the Hamiltonian in energy space and set up a very typical decimation renormalization procedure in, in DMRG. What you do is you choose the states which have the largest weight in a statistical embedding. And then basically you get a flow in the space of density matrix of reduced density matrices. Um, and there have been there have been people who have used this very extensively um, to analyze conformal field theory in one plus one dimension. This works perfectly well to extract the the central charges and all what you are interested in. Yeah, just quickly, so this numerical procedure that you presented will valid around the critical point where entanglement mm -hmm. will be maximum. It is sort of like it's valid around the critical point in the sense that of course the entanglement will grow. Typically, I mean, it typically grows as um, as the logarithm of um, of of the central charge. Um, uh, sorry, as the no, yeah, it's the log no, the logarithm of the length with the central charge as a prefactor. Sorry, uh, which means that the bond dimension or this uh, capital D will grow as a power in L, where the power is given by the central charge times a factor. So it's only a polynomial growth with size, which means you can do relatively large systems, say 1,000 sites is absolutely no problem, but then you have to do serious finite size scaling. 
but it's the fact that technically you cannot reach the thermodynamic limit, which is absolutely true in practice. Um, this is no problem. I and mean, we, I mean, we have been doing finite size extrapolation with great success on much smaller systems in the past. So that works very well. If I could just interrupt, I think it might be best if we continue, if you can continue that conversation between the two of you. I think we need to move on now. Let's thank mm -hmm. Ulrich once again for his, his contribution. And the next speaker is Stefan Knecht. Let me...